It's Monday, March 11. Good afternoon. I'm Herman Green with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. In a bid to transform and modernize the country's court system, Chief Justice Brian Sykes says he's committed to getting all outstanding judgments in the Supreme Court delivered by December 31. Justice Sykes made this revelation in a national broadcast on Sunday, where he also outlined several measures to be undertaken to achieve his mission. The details in this report. I am making it my mandate for us to have excellent courts. Chief Justice Brian Sykes giving his word to the country in a national broadcast on Sunday. Justice Sykes, who was appointed last year, says he is committed to transforming the judiciary with excellence and efficiency. This, among other efforts to make Jamaica's judiciary among the best in the world within six years. To support this vision, I give my commitment to put in place measures so that by December 31, 2019, all outstanding judgments in the Supreme Court will be delivered. As of 2020, a judgment should be delivered within 90 days and in exceptional cases, 180 days following completion of the case. Courts will start on time and the trial time productively utilized. Justice Sykes also outlined several measures which will be undertaken starting with the issue of trial and hearing date certainty. This means that the trial or hearing takes place on the day it is listed to begin. We no longer set multiple trials for each courtroom as this always leads to adjournments. Secondly, excellent courts are efficient. Time, human and material resources are properly utilized to produce the best outcomes. Thirdly, excellent courts mean that we have a culture of service among staff and the judges. Research has shown that the perception of court users is influenced by how they are treated and not only by the outcome of their cases. Justice Sykes also warned that courts will begin punctually and a trial time productively utilized. He wants cases disposed of within 24 months of entry into the courts. In some divisions of the Supreme Court, the gun court and the parish courts, the statistics show that more than 100 cases are being disposed of for every 100 cases filed. For the first time last year, seven parish courts had a clearance rate of over 100%. This has set the platform for us to clear the current backlog within six years. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, is confirming the government's claim that Jamaica's economy has grown. IMF representatives say the progress is reflected in the latest review. Details in this report. Jamaica has received positive results from the latest IMF test for the period ending December 2018. All 22 structural benchmarks under the IMF's precautionary standby arrangement to date were met. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark made the disclosure at the Joint Government of Jamaica IMF press conference at the Finance Ministry in Kingston on Friday. Uh, unemployment is at near record lows, interest rates are at record lows, inflation has been stable and consistently so for a number of uh, years. We have had 15 consecutive quarters of economic growth, the longest stretch of quarterly economic growth since we started measuring growth quarterly in 1997. We are seeing credit to the private sector expand and hitting new highs. IMF Chief to Jamaica Dr. Uma Ramakrishnan commended the Jamaican government for achieving economic growth over the review period. Again, the minister listed some of the major achievements on employment, inflation, and then the international reserves are um, adequate. The economy is growing, and so we see a lot of positive dividends coming from these economic reforms. For this review, all quantitative performance criteria as of end December 2018 were met, and the structural benchmark to table in Parliament, the amendments to the Bank of Jamaica Act, was completed in October 2018. The finance minister said that the government has reached a staff-level agreement with the IMF to reduce the primary balance target for the financial year 2019-2020 from 7% to 6.5%. 
we were able to increase uh, social spending and spending on growth-related activities uh, considerably, as well as engage in uh, fiscal reforms and uh, tax reductions that are aligned with the stimulation and cat, uh, cat, well, stimulation of economic growth. Prince Moore, TVJ News. Bad roads and the poor water supply are two issues residents of Kellitz and Clarendon say are slowing their progress in farming. The issues were discussed at a town hall meeting hosted by the National Integrity Action, NIA, and the Clarendon Parish Development Committee Benevolent Society. TVJ's O'Shea Masters has more in this story. And we do apologize for the absence of the audio on that story. The St. Anne police have clamped down on a major car stealing ring in Alexandria in the parish. So far, one man is in custody, while another is being sought in connection with the discovery on Friday evening. According to information reaching TVJ News, several motor vehicle parts were recovered at an open lot in Clydesdale, Alexandria. It's also understood that a silver Honda CRV, which was also found at the location, was reportedly featured in a murder in Westmoreland last year. Head of the St. Anne Police, Senior Superintendent Michael Smith, is appealing to persons who may have been victims of car theft to visit the St. Anne Police headquarters. The People's National Party is expressing optimism that it will retain the Portland Eastern seat after the by-election on April 4. Speaking to reporters yesterday, PNP President Dr. Peter Phillips noted that the party will be rallying their supporters to ensure the result is not in doubt. There is a tremendous outpouring of support because people want to restore, want to continue a legacy left by Dr. Bloomfield, particularly given the brutal circumstances which caused his death. They want to ensure that this kind of brutality is not given any sanction, any approval. In fact, they want to ensure that it is resisted in Portland, in East Portland in particular. Our support is well established among those who have, who have greater knowledge of the history, which are often the more mature voters. And I think Damian Crawford is an ideal candidate reaching out to the young people because he, he has that kind of vision and he shares their experience of life to a great degree. Meanwhile, starting this evening, our new center will begin releasing the results of the latest RGR Gleaner Don Anderson polls. Responses were sought from members of the public on issues such as the performance of the government and the opposition. They also weighed in on the worst performing minister and shadow minister, the Petrojam scandal, the states of public emergency and ongoing roadworks. You may catch details in primetime news this evening at 7. We go down to news overseas. In the United States, despite major cuts in the budget, the Donald Trump-led government is being criticized for an almost $9 billion request for his border wall. The details from the CNN. President Trump calls it a budget for a better America. Promises kept, taxpayers first. The president's plan promises a balanced budget in 15 years and calls for nearly $3 trillion in spending cuts. And then there's the elephant in the room. The whole issue of the wall and border security is of paramount importance. We have a crisis down there. A White House official says President Trump is requesting $8.6 billion for the border wall. Democrats control the House. They have enough votes in the Senate to try to, uh, to try to stop stuff from going through. House Majority Leader Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer released a statement Sunday blasting President Trump's expensive and ineffective wall and saying Congress would not back the request. Doubling down is doubly dangerous. As Pelosi and Schumer have pointed out, this could lead to another intractable set of negotiations that maybe shut the government again. Supporters say it's a risk the president is willing to take. We have to be much tougher and have more constructive immigration policy, which we will be developing uh, over a period of time. So yes, he's going to stay with his wall and he's going to stay with the border security theme. I think it's essential. 
and still overseas. Two devices containing flight data from the Ethiopian Airlines plane that crashed, killing all 157 people on board, have been recovered. We again go to the CNN for more. Just a short time ago, we had those uh, flight data recorders, the voice recorders, taken out of the impact crater behind me. They would have dug, in it, dug it out with one of these uh, large diggers, and then they rushed it off the scene into a truck that was waiting to take that. That will be a critical moment because they might now get a sense of what exactly happened when this brand new Boeing 737-800 plowed into this hillside behind me, killing all of those passengers tragically on board. And there have been terrible scenes here. Red Cross officials have been gingerly taking uh, private belongings of people, placing it in a corner. And you just see the impact. The plane was ripped apart. There are even bits and pieces sitting behind me that are only maybe an inch uh, big metal just torn apart. Uh, U.S. ambassador spoke to us just a short time ago, said that investigators from America arriving tomorrow morning, Interpol, will be leading the grim task of identifying the bodies in conjunction with Ethiopian and Kenyan officials. But the question is, why? And we go down to news and sports. Jamaican left arm spinner Nikita Miller has called time on his first class career following the Scorpions' two wicket defeat to the Barbados Pride yesterday. Trishana McGowan has that report. On Thursday, Nikita Miller told TVJ Sports that he would evaluate his position on retirement following the Scorpions' final four day game against the Trinidad and Tobago Red Force. However, following the Scorpions' defeat on Sunday, the 36-year-old revealed that he has reached the end of the line. Well, I, I think it is the last game. Um, just going to have a discussion in, inside, just, you know, show some appreciation, you know, to my teammates. You know, I played for a number of years and I kind of enjoyed, you know, the company of these guys and in the past players, you know, past captain Tamar and some of the other players from, from in my time. So, you know, it was, I think it was a great career and I totally enjoyed myself playing you know, in this competition against some great players as well. But what has changed between Thursday and Sunday that has led to his decision? On Friday, I did my box. I, you know, after about 12 overs, I had to have the physio come on the field about two, two times. So I was, I was kind of struggling. So I was just going through the motion, motions, you know, bowling within myself just to complete, you know, you know, that, the, the spell. Because Miller ends his first class career with 538 wickets. In the meantime, fast bowler Jerome Taylor, in talking about Miller, says he's yet to give any thought of his retirement. Well, um, I'm just taking it one step at a time. And um, as to Nikita, he, he has been a servant of the game, which is, is a gentleman. He displays his skill out there for Jamaica. And he's a true champion, I must say. And um, whichever way he chooses to go from here, um, I'm a supporter of him. Taylor on Sunday completed his 103rd first class game. Trishonda McGowan, TVJ Sports. And that's the Midday News. Remember to join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, I'm Herman Green. Good afternoon.